Okay, can you believe it? We're already to chapter 10. The semester is going by so quickly. But uh, in any case, this is chapter 10, which deals with waves and sound. And we're going to start looking at waves, and we're going to learn to identify the different parts of a wave and, you know, how waves behave. Now, the first thing that you should know is that waves are always very closely tied to vibrations. It's vibrating systems that create waves. Things that vibrate are necessary for waves to be created. And so vibrations and waves are tied together. Now, this picture is a little bit weird, so I'm going to try to explain it. Here you have a mass on a spring, and you, if, if the spring were at rest, the ball would be right here but somebody has pulled it down and let it go. So when they let it go, the ball is gonna go up and down, up and down, up and down, because that's how springs behave. And now what's weird here is this mass has a magic marker atta attached to it. And underneath it is a super long sheet of paper. And you can see these blue arrows over here. They indicate that this paper is being pulled. And it's important to understand it's being pulled at a steady rate. And so, as this marker attached to this mass oscillates, vibrates up and down, the paper is dragged underneath it, and the pen is going to trace a wave. And so the wave that we see on the paper is directly tied to the vibration of this spring going up and down. Now, you might know that when you speak, there are two cords in your throat called your vocal cords, and they vibrate. That vibration creates sound, which is a different kind of wave, and we're going to talk about sound uh, later in this chapter. But the point is that your vocal cords are vibrating, and that's making a wave. And so we can see that the, the big takeaway from this slide is that vibrating things are what are necessary to create waves. Now, for those of you that have had a little bit of math, maybe you had trigonometry in high school or in college, the particular shape that's traced out is actually a sine wave or a cosine wave. And you might know that those two are equivalent to each other, just displaced a little bit from one another. If you have no idea what a sine wave is, don't worry about it. But a sine wave is a mathematical wave that has this basic shape. And so... Um, the point is that you can actually write down an equation that describes how this this wave goes. And uh, again, don't worry about it if you don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, get the idea that the wave is being produced by the vibrating system here. So if we want to understand how waves behave, we need to understand the different parts of the wave. And so the first thing that we're going to talk about here is called the amplitude. And the amplitude is the distance from the midpoint of the wave. So let's look up at our graph here. You can see the middle of the wave is represented by this dashed green line across the center of the wave. So that's the midpoint of the wave and the distance of the midpoint to the wave to its crest. Now, the crest is the maximum height of the wave and the minimum height or the one, it's actually maximum to the bottom, that's called the trough. And so we have the crest up here, the trough down here. And so the amplitude is the distance from the midpoint to the crest. Coincidentally, it would also be the midpoint down to the trough. But this highest value of the wave at the crest or the trough, the distance of that to the center is called the amplitude of the wave. And by the way, since an amplitude is a distance, it's usually going to have units like meters or feet or some other kind of distance unit. Now I've gone to a new slide here. It looks pretty much the same, but you can see over here, I've got a new definition. So in the previous slide, we talked about the amplitude. The next thing we want to talk about is the wavelength. And the wavelength is the distance from one crest of the wave to the next crest. And so remember the crest is the maximum height here. And so if I, if I go all the way over to the next time the maximum height occurs, that distance is the wavelength. Now, technically, the real definition of a wavelength is the distance it takes a wave to repeat itself. And so you can see in the picture, they've, they've noticed there's a point right here. I've marked it with kind of a blue X. 
this is any point in the wave. I just, you know, because that's the one the picture chose, I picked that one, but I could pick that point or that point. I can pick any point in the wave. And I want to go the distance to the wave repeats itself. Now, it's a little bit tricky because we're talking about the height. So we've got this green line here from the center down there to my blue X. That's a particular height. And so the wave goes up and it comes down to that same height, but we're not quite to the full wavelength there because that's not a repeating of the wave. What's different is this. Here, so think about we're tracing this, this wave. The wave is going up, and we've made our little blue X. And so now the wave has got its maximum height, and now it's going down. Now we get to the same height that we had with the blue X, but our wave is going down, not up. So it's not repeating itself yet. If I continue going down, I get to that same height as my blue X again, but now I'm going up. Over here I'm going up, over here I'm going up, so that is the wave repeating itself. That is the wavelength of the wave. Now, this wavelength has the same length as that wavelength. It's a lot easier to remember crest to crest, and so that's the best way to remember what a wavelength is. It's the distance of the wave from the maximum height to the next time the maximum height occurs. From the crest to the crest, the distance between two successive crests. That is the wavelength. The last thing I want to mention is this weird symbol here. That's the usual symbol that we use to represent a wavelength. And that's actually a letter from the Greek alphabet. It's, it's the Greek letter lambda. And so the wavelength is usually represented by lambda, which again is just a funky symbol that's taken as one of the letters from the Greek alphabet. The next thing that we want to talk about is the frequency of the wave. Now the frequency of the wave is the number of vibrations of a system that occur every second. Now, rather than thinking about the wave, it's sometimes easier to think about the thing making the wave. And so think about it like this. I've pulled this guy down and I let him go. And so this mass here with the marker is going to be going up and down, up and down. The, the number of times it goes up and back down to the bottom in one second, that's the frequency. The Going up and coming all the way back down, that's considered to be one cycle of the vibration. And so the number of vibrations that occur every second, that's called the frequency. So let me read the definition again. The number of, the number of vibrations of a system that occur every second. So for our system here, it's the number of times this thing goes up and down every second. So if it goes up and down five times every second, that would be the frequency, five vibrations per second. Now, there's a unit that we can use that means vibrations per second, and that's called a hertz. And it's named after a famous scientist who studied different kinds of waves, but the hertz, which is abbreviated with a capital H and a lowercase z, that is a unit of frequency. And it's vibrations per second. That is what a hertz is. And again, the hertz is a unit of a frequency, the number of vibrations per second. The next thing that we want to talk about is the period of the wave. And that's usually represented by a capital T. Now, a period is a time, and specifically, it's the time it takes for one complete cycle. In other words, I stretch this guy down and I let him go. It's the time it takes for the little mass to go all the way up to the top and then come all the way back down to the bottom. That's one complete cycle. If I got my stopwatch out and timed it, that would be the period. Now, when we're talking about a wave, we've already talked about that the wavelength is the distance the wave will travel in one cycle, the distance between one crest to the next. So that wave in one cycle has gone from here down and back up to there, one wavelength occurs in one period. And so the alternate way that we can define the period is we can say it's the time it takes the wave to travel one full wavelength. Now, I've got a figure from your textbook, figure 10.2, and it says the source of any wave is something that vibrates. Now, this, you might recognize, is a crude picture of a radio tower. And the radio tower is sending out radio waves, which, you know, if you're in your car listening to the radio, there's an antenna in your car that's receiving those radio waves and con converting the information they contain into 
sound waves that you can listen to, someone singing or talking or whatever. So what is it that's actually vibrating in the radio uh, tower? Well, the radio tower is made out of metal, and it actually creates electrons having an oscillating current going back and forth. Remember, that's like an alternating current. And so you have this, these electrons vibrating back and forth in this tower, and those electrons are vibrating, and they generate radio waves. You might remember in the last chapter, we talked about how vibrating charges create electromagnetic waves. Well, radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and this is how they're typically generated on Earth uh, for commercial purposes like TV and radio. Now, in this particular example, it says electrons in the transmitting antenna vibrate 940,000 times each second. That would be 940 kilohertz, because remember, kilo is a thousand, like a kilometer is a thousand meters. A kilohertz is a thousand hertz, so 940,000 hertz or 940 kilohertz radio waves. Now, radio waves, they cannot be seen or heard by our eyes and our ears, but they can contain information that sends a pattern to tell a radio or a TV set what sounds and or pictures to make. And by the way, there is a relationship between the frequency of a wave and a period of the wave. The frequency is equal to 1 over the period. And so we could write that as an equation like this, and or we could just write it out in words as is here. The frequency is 1 divided by the period. So that's the number of vibrations per second is 1 over the time it takes for one vibration. Remember, that's what the period is. The period is the time it takes for one vibration. So the number of vibrations per second equals 1 over the time it takes for one vibration. Now, the converse of that is also true. We can do some algebra, and we can move period up top here and frequency down below, and we would get a different version of the formula that says the period of the wave is equal to 1 divided by the frequency. And we could write that as an equation, the period of the wave is equal to 1 divided by the frequency, and that is an equivalent relationship to the one up above. Those two are equal to each other. Um, they're just different ways of expressing the same relationship, the relationship between the period of a wave and its frequency. Already in this lecture, we've got lots and lots of definitions, and we're still going. The next definition that we want to talk about is wave speed. I just want to pause for a minute and give you a little bit of advice because there's so many definitions in this chapter, and this is these definitions, right now we're talking about just waves in general. In the rest of the chapter, we're going to apply these definitions to sound waves, and then in the next chapter, we're going to apply them to light waves. So it's actually really important that you understand what all these definitions are and what they mean so that when I talk about the wave speed or the wavelength, you know what the difference is between them. And so please do take some time to write these definitions out, study them, make sure that you keep them straight in your mind. Because the chapter quiz that you're going to have to take, you're going to have to know all these different definitions to be able to answer the questions. Anyway, let's get on with the definition of wave speed. Now, I've got something that's vibrating back and forth and it's sending waves out. It could be sound waves or light waves or radio waves or some other kind of waves. But these waves are moving out. And so if they're moving, they have to have some kind of speed. Now, remember what the definition of speed is. Speed is the distance something travels divided by the time it takes for it to travel. Now, when we're talking about waves, we know that the standard block of distance for a wave is the wavelength, and the standard block of time for a wave is the period of the wave. The distance it travels in one cycle divided by the time it travels in one cycle, that's also going to be a speed, and it's going to be a speed unique to that particular wave. And so that's actually how we define the speed of a wave, or simply the wave speed. It's given by the wavelength, that is the distance the wave travels in one full cycle of the vibration, divided by the period, the time it takes 
for one full cycle of the vibration. Distance over time, wavelength over period, and that gives us, in equation form, we could write that as lambda over capital T. Remember that lambda is the symbol for the wavelength and the capital T is the symbol for the period. Now here's another kind of wave that we can talk about. We've talked about sound waves and radio waves and such. A wave that most people have seen, I'd probably guess that all of you have seen at some point in your life, is water waves. Now, we've seen waves of the ocean at the beach, but also waves even on a pond. If you've ever thrown a stone into a pond, you've seen that the stone lands and there are ripples of water that travel out. And so if you're kind of looking top down at the surface of the water, it looks like you have these concentric circles that are traveling outward. And that is the water wave that is generated by the impact of that stone or whatever it is that strikes the water in the surface. Now, if instead of looking above the water, you were kind of swimming and you were down at eye level, you would notice that the waves were actually traveling up and down as they were going in a particular direction. And so if you were facing this part of the wave, you would see it going to the right and it would be going up and down. Now, if you were if you were up here and this was your eye and you were looking kind of straight down, you would see something like these circles over here traveling outward. But we're looking straight into the page and so we would see the ripples like that. This peak here is representing one of the lines of the ripples. And so what you're actually seeing, these ripples that you see moving out, what you're actually seeing move out is the peak or the crest of the wave. And then the middle here is where the trough would be. And so the crest of the waves are what you see as these concentric circles when you're looking top down. If you're looking sort of direct on, you would see what looks more like a normal wave. Now you can see the... Uh, description of this picture, it says, if the wavelength is one meter long, and you can see this in the picture from the crest to the crest is one meter, and one wavelength per second passes the pole, that means so this guy here, it takes one second to get from there to there, it's traveled one wavelength in one second, then the velocity is going to be one meter per second. So read this caption again, look at the picture, see if my description makes sense to you. If it doesn't, shoot me an email or something, ask a question because it's really important that you get these concepts down. I hope that everything is clear, but if not, contact me and I will do my best to clarify. Now, we have one of our understanding checkpoints to make sure that we have some of these basic concepts down pat. And so the first question asks, if a train of freight cars, each 10 meters long, rolls by you at a rate of three cars each second, what is the speed of the train? So, we've got 10 meters for each car and three pass you per second. That means that 30 meters worth of train is passing you every second. That tells us that the speed is going to be 30 meters per second. And we can say that is the answer to question one. Now, if one train length represented the same thing as one wavelength, and we know that the speed of a wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, in this case, the wavelength would be 10 meters, and the frequency would be 3 hertz because there's three wavelengths passing every second, that would give us again a speed of 30 meters over seconds. Remember a wavelength is the number of vibrations, in this case three, per second. And so the units of hertz are actually one over seconds. Now for question two, it says, if a water wave oscillates up and down three times each second and the distance between wave crests is two meters, A, what is its frequency, B, what is its wavelength, and C, what is its wave speed? 
All right, so for 2a, we want to find the frequency. And we're told that it oscillates up and down three times each second. And so that would give us a frequency of three vibrations per second, or three hertz. Now for part B, it asks, what is the wavelength? Here we're told that the distance between wave crests is two meters. That means that the wavelength is two meters. And so I can write down that the wavelength is given by lambda. Remember, lambda is that weird Greek letter that means wavelength. Lambda is equal to 2 meters, or the wavelength is equal to 2 meters. Why? Because the distance between the crests is 2 meters. That's what the wavelength is. And by the way, I probably should have written it in. This guy here, this 3 hertz, that is the frequency. So we could write that, we could say F equals 3 hertz if we wanted to. Now for part C, we are asked to find the wave speed, and we know that V is equal to lambda times F. That's going to be 2 meters times 3 hertz, and that gives us 6 meters per second. And that would be the wave speed for this wave. It would be 6 meters per second. And there it is, so we'll continue with the next part of the lecture in the next video.